Welcome to Bert's Battles and our series on the life and battles of Quintus Sertorius, Roman rebel and guerrilla captain of Spain. For eight years this Marian senator and propraetor fought and defeated Roman armies sent to destroy him by the victorious sullen regime in Rome. A tactical genius and exceptional regular commander, the life and times of Sertorius deserve an in-depth series. His war and political career in Hispania serving as a golden example of grit and determination, as well as almost inhuman courage and ingenuity in the face of overwhelming odds. Quintus Sertorius hailed from the Sabine town of Nursia, a settlement already ancient even by his own time, the place likely inhabited since the Neolithic era. Nursia had been conquered during the Sabine Wars, its citizens granted Roman citizenship in 268 BC. Though Quintus was a homo novus, the first of his family to gain an office in Rome, the Sertorius family were hardly dirt poor. They were probably of Equites rank, or the social rank below the senatorial class, very well to do, with many Equites actually being wealthier than many patrician and senatorial families. Sertorius was doted on by his widowed mother, Rare, the boy developing a keen mind and athleticism that would eventually become exceptional. Rare clearly held nothing back that would enhance her growing son, and Quintus reciprocated this devotion, his biographer Plutarch noting disapprovingly that he was excessively fond of her in turn, suggesting a close bond. By his early to mid-teens, Sertorius exhibited a good knowledge of law, the classics and oratory. Indeed, the latter discipline proved a particular strength, with the famed orator Cicero himself granting him a grudging praise. Such a silver tongue would have done much to distinguish Quintus in Rome among the other country nobles, those men prominent in their localities, but not well known in Rome itself. Luckily for the young and ambitious Quintus, his unpolished oratory was not his only talent. Around 16 years old, he first entered military service. He was likely ranked among the Cohors and Micorum, a body of friends that surrounded the commander of an army. Unfortunately for Sertorius, his commander was Roman proconsul Servilius Capio, and the teenager's first battle would be the disastrous confrontation at Arasio in 105 BC. As a military tribune in Capio's army, Sertorius would distinguish himself both for his courage, physical prowess and determination. Arasio was one of the great military disasters of Roman history, ranked alongside Carnai and Teutoburg Forest, yet it was a defeat framed in the larger Cimbrian War that had raged since 113 BC. The Germanic tribes known as the Cimbri, Teutons and Ambronis and Tigurini had sparked conflict due to their migration from the Jutland Peninsula area, defeating a Roman army in 113 at Berea. Left exposed, Rome herself was ripe for attack, yet for reasons unknown the barbarians moved west into Gaul and ravaged this area for the better part of a decade. In fairness to the hapless Capio, his was merely the worst of a bad bunch of defeats. The Romans bested by the barbarians under Marcus Junius Silanus and at the Battle of Berdigala in 109 and 107 BC respectively. By 105, the Republic raised perhaps its largest army ever, mustering around 120,000 men, 80,000 of these comprising the dozen or so legions within which marched our young military tribune. This number is impressive on the face of it, but conceals a tragic fact. The Roman response was divided. Of the two consuls for the year, it was Gnaeus Maelius Maximus who marched north. This was odd, considering that the other consul was, unlike his colleague, experienced in war. Yet perhaps his affiliation with the controversial Gaius Marius influenced the decision to keep him in Rome. It's also possible that Gnaeus Malleus Maximus merely demanded his own shot at glory, his consular colleague Publius Rutilius Rufus having already gained glory during the Jugurthine War. Whatever the case, the untried Malleus was not a man Sertorius's commander wanted to work with. Not only was he untried, but the consul was also, like Capio's junior officer, a new man, a man of no patrician heritage, and thus unworthy of the patrician Capio's obedience. As the consul, as opposed to Capio as a proconsul, 
Roman law dictated Capio place himself under the consul's command, yet Capio ignored both the law and Malleus's orders, camping apart from his fellow commander. This proved decisive in the slaughter to follow, both Roman forces camped on opposite sides of the Rhone River near the town of Aracio in Gallia Transalpina. This certainly was no time for petty jealousies in high command, as opposing Roman arms was the 200,000 strong horde of Cimbri and Teutons under their kings Biorix and Teutobod respectively. Capio eventually did cross the river after the senate sent a direct order for him to do so, but stubbornly camped apart from his nominal commander. What Capio's military tribune and new man Sertorius thought of his general's disdain for Malleus is unknown, but he may have relished the opportunity that Capio was about to provide for martial glory. Capio got word that the king of the Cimbri had opened negotiations with Malleus, and now his ambition compounded the folly of his pride, and he independently chose to seize the initiative, ordering an attack on the barbarian camp. This assault was thoroughly defeated, the Roman force annihilated to the point that even Capio's camp was ravaged. The enraged Cimbri and Teutons had turned their wrath towards Malleus's demoralised and unprepared force, surrounding and cutting them down almost to a man. Almost. A later source, Orosius, informs us that of the vast 120,000 force, just ten men escaped. Both Malleus and Capio himself were among these, and we know, if this number is even accurate, that among the other eight was Quintus Sertorius. In truth, common sense dictates that it's more likely hundreds at least survived, given Plutarch writes the Romans had been put to flight, as we shall see. Whatever the exact numbers, the slaughter was near complete, yet though fleeing for his life, even such an act was for Sertorius to be done with honour and with great personal fortitude. Plutarch writes, quote, After the Romans had been defeated and put to flight, Sertorius made his way across the Rhone. He swam against a strongly adverse current, wearing shield, breastplate and all. Though he had lost his horse and had taken a body wound, so tough was his body, so trained was he to bear hardship. This description thus gives us an impressive portrait of our Roman hero, tough enough to swim armoured across the treacherous river while enduring the pain of a wound and under threat of recapture and execution. As with Nerea, both Rome and Sertorius were fortunate in the aftermath of Horatio. The slaughter had proved a bloody baptism of fire and a masterclass on how not to command for the future Roman rebel. Now the Cimbri and Teutons could have turned their attention to the fertile lands of Italia itself, but instead marched west and into Sertorius's future theatre of war, Hispania. As for the young Quintus Sertorius, Horatio would not be his end, but merely the bloody beginning of his work in the war against the barbarians and in his greater, brighter future as one of Rome's great commanders. Next time, Sertorius serves under another iconic leader of the late Republic era, Gaius Marius. We explore Sertorius the spy and the conclusion of the Cimbrian War, so join us for that one, and we shall see you next time.